What's up? A step up family. I am Johnny Allen, executive. And welcome to our second masterclass. Man, we have an exciting evening planned for you guys. And if you missed the first masterclass with Bev Kearney, it was outstanding. So joining us today is, is Felicia Hall Allen, as well as our uh, masterclass speaker, uh, Miss Val, who Felicia will introduce. And for the Step Up family, you are in for a treat. We have our own Felicia Hall Allen as moderator today. So I've got just a couple of things that we want to share with you, and then we'll get right into our masterclass. So um, the masterclass is a lead up to a Step Up Symposium. Our Step Up Symposium will start on May the 3rd this year, and we'll have a Step Up, Next Level, our Executive Head Coaches uh, Leadership, and we also will have our Hall of Fame this year. So you don't want to miss it. Uh, Hall of Fame is going to be on May the 2nd. And we have our class from 2020 that will be uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame. Step Up is going to be on May the 3rd and the 4th. Two days of phenomenal speaking, exit and O's, panels, discussions, roundtables, and networking opportunities. So you don't want to miss that. But today... Let's get to business. Our master class speaker, Ms. Val. I'm going to introduce our moderator for the evening. You all know her, and I'm not going to go in her, her long bio because she's done an exceptional job of making other people's dreams come true. So what I'm going to do is pull out just a few excerpts from her bio, and let's get right into the business. Felicia Hall Aunt Allen was recently honored alongside President Barack Obama and his wife, Michelle, and Vice President Kamala Harris, Ben Trump, LeBron James, Stacey Adams, uh, Abram, in Core Magazine as the top 100 most influential Black uh, today. She's also worked to name the Maya Angelou Women Who Lead Award. She's worked with the NCAA Finals. She's worked with Women of, of Impact. She's worked with the NFL, as well as the United States Olympic Committee and Fortune 500 companies across the nation. She is one of the most sought out the speakers, trainers, and she's uh, an attorney. So Felix is probably gonna chuck, cut me off and we'll keep going, but she's done a phenomenal job. I want to introduce her as your moderator for this evening's masterclass. Felicia? Johnny, the one thing I was hoping to hear you say and that she's the most loving and beautiful wife that a man could ever hope to have. And that's why I really wanted to introduce you to her tonight. So thank you so much, Johnny, for all of your love and support. I and for all of that. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you also for joining me and us taking a step up along with our board of directors to create our second masterclass experience. I would love for you all to meet Valerie Condos Field. Johnny, thank you for joining us. Aisha, let's get this show started. I'll catch you guys on the back end. We all have an expiration date. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to think about it, but we do. I don't fear that at all. But what I want to make sure that I don't do is waste one day of my life. We are very excited to start our conference on such a high note. Join me in welcoming the incomparable Miss Val to the party. Here we go. Let's listen up, people. I was 22 years old. I'd not gone to college. And I heard UCLA needed a dance coach for their gymnastics team. Without any hesitation, I found out who the head coach was. I called him up. He said, we don't have a salary for you, but I can give you a full scholarship. That would have never happened had I been afraid to make the ask. I don't believe in the word failure. I believe that failure is simply another F word that somebody made up to make us feel badly about ourselves. If you learn something in life along the way, how can it be failure? It can't, it doesn't exist. We have to redefine success. It cannot be all about winning. I got a call from my doctor. She said, so you've got a very aggressive form of breast cancer. Everything we do is a choice and at that moment, I realized I didn't have to get chemo. I got to get chemo. Taking care of yourself from the inside out is gonna affect everything else you wanna do in life. Whenever you try to be somebody else, you will always be a second-rate them. 
And the worst thing is it prevents you from being a first rate you. Think of the one thing that you love doing in life that makes your heart sing. Fuel that light inside of you. Own it and then share your light. Champions make everybody else around them better. Superheroes are the ones that lift everybody up. So my question to you is, in what genre do you see yourself? Miss Val. Felicia. After taking a look at that, I feel like putting on Whitney Houston and playing that song, I want to dance with somebody. I feel like it's time to get the party started. You all, our masterclass speaker for this evening has been featured on CBS News, Good Morning America, CBS This Morning, Dateline, and we've read about her in People Magazine, the LA Times, and the New York Times. Valerie Condos Field is affectionately known as Miss Val. She coached at UCLA for 37 years before retiring. In 2019, Miss Val won seven national championships, 519 career wins, 18 conference championships, one Pac 12 Century Coach of the Year with zero years of gymnastics experience. I would say that I could read a number of different things about her, but in just the short time that I have known her, and I am grateful to Nikki Fargus, the head coach at LSU who worked with Miss Val at UCLA for introducing us. Miss Val, you have demonstrated to me that you are a living epistle. And if I only had six words to describe you, it would be grace, joy, beautiful, yet competitive spirit. Tonight, I would like to invite you, welcome you along with the A Step Up Board of Directors and Johnny Allen. We would like to welcome you to Miss Val's A Step Up Masterclass, presented by our sponsor and our friends, Worth Advisors. Welcome to our second masterclass. Hello, Miss Val. Hello, Felicia. Wow, <laughs> I got a little choked up there while you were saying all that. Thank you so much. Man, it has been an honor just getting to know you over the last couple of weeks. And one of the things that really blew me away is when I heard you say, Felicia, I've never competed as a gymnast. <laughs> I was a ballerina, but never a gymnast, not in high school, not at any level. And I started to ask myself, what made you think that you could do this at this level and achieve the kind of success that you've been able to achieve? Oh, gosh. <clears throat> First of all, as you heard in the video, I thankfully I had parents who didn't believe in the word failure. Like I, I still don't believe in that concept of failing, failing at anything. So I've never been afraid to try anything. Um, but I was, when I got to UCLA, they hired me to be the dance coach and choreographer. So I knew I could do dance that I had 17 years of classical ballet training, but then they, they called me in the athletic director's office and they offered me the head job and the head coaching job. And I laughed out loud. And I said, you remember, I don't know the first thing about gymnastics. And the AD said, well, we trust you'll figure it out. And that's all I got. So you asked what made me think I could do it? Absolutely nothing. Um, but as I later grew to get to know Coach John Wooden, became very good friends with him. He became my mentor. Um, you know, the cornerstones of his pyramid of success are industriousness and enthusiasm. And I, that's how I was raised. Industriousness, hard work, and enthusiasm, joy, and a good attitude. And I've just always brought that every day to everything I've done. And I think that's like the secret sauce. I love how you brought John, Coach John Wooden 
to our Step Up Masterclass. I can see his book in the background and then I can see parts of the pyramid in the background. I know that Corey Close, the women's basketball coach there, talks a lot about the pyramid of success and she does things in a very uncommon way with her program. When I was listening to your TED talk though, you said it was time for you to take a time out. And then you said, winning is fun, but is all winning success. What did you mean by that? You're a woman with three, I mean, three national coach of the year honors, a Pac-12 coach of the century honor, seven national championships. What do you mean it's not all about winning? Because they part, say so, that if you're not winning, you're not playing or you're not right. trying. And as a coach, you're hired to win. Mm -hmm. You're not hired to be their mentor or their best friend, their teacher. Um, but that really hit me hard. I was in Washington, D.C. I was meeting with Senator Dianne Feinstein, and it was the year um, that sadly we learned about the USA gymnastics uh, uh, doctor, team physician, Larry Nassar, and all of the women that had come forward as, as sexual abuse victims of his. And I remember Senator Feinstein asking me, you know, how do we change the culture of gymnastics? And I was like, it's not about gymnastics. It's about the people at the top that oversee everything. And that's when I, I, I realized that as a country, USA Gymnastics is like the top of the world. And we have been for a while. But can we say that success if hundreds and hundreds of young people have come forward as sexual abuse victims? No, we can't. And that's what me what made me want to speak to that in my TED talk. And that's where I was like, okay, we need to, all of us, whether anybody who oversees the, the development of another human being, especially a child, we need to ask ourselves, what, what does winning look like? And how does it differentiate from success? And is all winning success? And that's really what got me started with my TED talk. You know, I kind of thought about the fact that when coaches are hired, like you said, they are hired to win. You were at UCLA for several decades. At what stage in your career did you figure out that it's not just about the win? Great question. Um, when I was first hired, I was uh, 29, 30 years old, hadn't never participated in athletics ever. I was a ballerina. And so I thought, well, let's just do, I, I did the prudent thing. The only thing I knew how to do was to mimic other head coaches who had won, who had been successful. Pat Summit was one of those. Um, sadly, Bobby Knight, because I was like, well, he wins, you know. Um, I shouldn't say sadly. There are a lot of his players that did enjoy him. Um, and it was fun to watch him kick those chairs. I got to go to a few games having played in the Big Ten. And I tell you what, it was like, um, what do we call it now? Reality TV. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but I just tried to be other people. It's like I grew up on stage acting. I can act just like act like a coach. So it, especially back in the in those days, a coach was dictatorial. They were tough minded. There was no gray area. There was only black and white, my way, the highway. And that's how I acted. And I was not good. I was pathetic. And consequently, I did not develop the talent of our team. And we, I didn't develop, help them develop to their talent. So true story, I'm on my way to resign, to remind the athletic director, I told you so. I told you I don't know anything about how to be a head coach of, a, of an athletic team. And I was walking through the student store and I did not just put this there for this, but that book was in the student store, uh, Coach Wooden's book on leadership. And it miraculously opened up to his definition of success. And it read, success is peace of mind, which is a direct result in knowing you've done your best. And I thought, this is crazy. No, no, no. Success as a coach is winning. And he won 10 out of 12 championships. 
And I read it over and over and over until finally I had the biggest aha moment of my professional career. Success is peace of mind and knowing you have done your best. I had been trying to be somebody else. Mm -hmm. And in that instant, I realized, as you saw in the video, that when you try to be someone else, you'll always be a second rate them. And the worst thing is it will prevent you from becoming everything you're supposed to be. So I didn't resign and I went back to my office and I figured, what do I bring to the table? And that's when I really started to think, if I'm going to do this job, I don't believe in winning at all cost, partly because I didn't grow up in that culture. So why am I going to do the job? And it was so obvious to me that sport is a masterclass in teaching really, really, really tough life lessons that For some reason, Ms. Val, you went mute. Am I back? Yes, you're back. So I'm going to develop champions in life that are going to go out in the world and make the world a better place. I'm going to develop champions in life through sport. And if I do that well enough, it's going to translate to the competition floor and we're going to win. And so that's when I started to shift. The second thing that happened, Felicia, was, and I don't know how many coaches out there have experienced this, but if you haven't, you probably should choreograph this in because it was one of the biggest moments of my coaching career. My entire team asked me for a team meeting, and I thought it was going to be like Kumbaya. And for two solid hours, they gave me examples after example of how my coaching style was hurtful and demeaning. And in that, like I thought, as I'm looking at all of them, I'm the head coach. I'm supposed to posture as this strong head coach. If you don't like it, then you can get the heck out. And I thought, but wait a minute, is my intention to make them feel less than? No, that was never my intention. So they're not the ones that have to change. I have to change. Um, and that just started me thinking differently about coaching. It started me thinking differently that um, about the difference. And, and first of all, I have to say, I think all coaches, it, you, you have to have a growth mindset. You have to enjoy being curious and you have to continue learning, reading, watching TED Talks, watching podcasts, because this, the generations are changing and we have to continue to learn how to best connect with them, not dictate to them. And I realized that there are two styles of coaching. One is dictating. This is just do it because I said so. And the other is figuring out how to motivate change. Because when you think about it, the only reason somebody needs a coach in their life is to help them do the things they can't do on their own. So I started shifting into how can I motivate this 18 year old to want to make different decisions in her life to have a better result? And that became the challenge. You know what, um, Miss Val, you talk about motivating. I think that what you do and coaches who achieve championship status level, at some point it transitions from motivating to inspiring because the inspiration I think is what elevates you to the next level and makes you believe that you can do anything. And you talked a lot about old school way of coaching and new school way of coaching. What do you think is the number one mistake that most coaches make? And what do you think that the new school coaches that are being successful now, what's the one thing that you think that they're doing differently that other coaches are not doing? I think the number one thing that coaches are doing that they shouldn't do is pretend to know, have all the answers and to posture like you are the end all be all. And I feel like the new school way of coaching is modeling the behavior that you would like to see from your staff and your coaches, which often includes like we coaches, we want our staff and we want our, our athletes to be able to admit when they've made a mistake. We want them to be able to sincerely apologize, whether it's to the staff or to their teammates. And 
and know that once you apologize and it's sincere, you move on. Um, I'm teaching a course um, at UCLA uh, Graduate School of Education on transformative coaching and leadership. And we're studying 10 different coaches that have been successful that have very different styles of coaching. But the underlying book that we are reading throughout that quarter, the quarter is uh, Brene Brown's book, Dare to Lead, because she talks about the power and the impact that what used to be called soft skills have, and I call them human skills, vulnerability, compassion, empathy, courage, and how it's interesting when, when we did the debrief after the last class that I taught, and every student in the class played sports or is a graduate uh, coach, every one of them said, I didn't grow up thinking that vulnerability and, humil and humility were strong characteristics, but now I see that they are. And I think that to answer your question, Felicia, that coaches, really coaches that are in tune with how to connect with the athlete, they, they value those skills. They value humility and they see it as a strength. I would agree with you 100%. It sounds like you and Bev Kearney, our previous masterclass speaker, are kindred spirits. And then, you know, I think about my own college coach, Vivian Stringer, who's in the Naismith Hall of Fame, and they've been honoring her on a number of different platforms for Black History Month. But I always said that she was a model of what grace under fire looked like, because we never really saw her sweat but we always saw her persevere through no matter what it is that she was going through. I mean, her strength was incredible. And the things that you've gone through in your life, it sounds like you also were a model of what it looked like to handle, not just handle pressure, but like Betty White to kick the door down and just like keep fighting and keep going. Um, one of the things that was interesting to me, I watch your TED Talk. And if you've not seen Miss Val's TED Talk, you might want to tune in, Google Miss Val TED Talk. You talked a lot about a very close relationship with one of your student athletes, Caitlin Ohashi. And I wanted to ask you, what was the key to building the relationship that you had with Caitlin? Because you talked a little bit about how she was broken when you got her and not very motivated. What did you do to build her back up and to get her to compete at an international level of success? Yes, I remember Caitlin's freshman year, we were having a team meeting and Caitlin came in and was basically a rebel her freshman year and um, was, literally like she was about 60% of the athlete that she could be, that we recruited her to be. And in this team meeting, she very unapologetically said, I just don't want to be great anymore. And I felt like I had been cold cocked or cold water was thrown in my face. And I thought, then what the heck am I giving you a full scholarship for? Thankfully, I didn't say that. And then I realized the reason she didn't want to be great wasn't because she didn't like gymnastics. It was because everything she associated with being great made her life miserable. And I realized that I'm going to need to earn her trust that I care more about her as a whole human being than as an athlete that can help, that can help me win another ring. And, you know, we've heard a lot about this movement. I am more than an athlete. And that was the mentality that I had. And so I only talked to Caitlin about gymnastics in the gym. And outside of the gym, I was curious about her life and her interests. And I remember um, talking to her about her interests. And she said, I don't, I don't know. I really don't know. And I said, well, why don't you go look up some TED Talks and just see what resonates? And she came in the next day totally open to this whole other world that had resonated with her. And she said she spent four hours watching TED Talks on the effect of body shaming, the effect of bullying, the plight of the homeless. And that to this day continues to be what she's passionate about. And so to answer your question, 
we all want to be, we all want to be respected and appreciated and valued as our, our entirety, as whole humans. And athletes want their coaches to get them to know them beyond the X's and O's. And it takes time to do that. You know, I'm going to just go off on a little tangent here, Felicia. Um, one of my mentors and a dear friend of mine, one of the greatest coaches that ever lived, Sue Enquist. She's won 11 national championships in softball. I agree. And uh, <laughs> she talks, she has this wonderful way of speaking about currency and how us coaches look at the time we have with our athletes in the gym or on the field as currency. And most of us don't want to use our currency on anything besides strength, conditioning, X's and O's, learning the playbook. But when we take the time to take part of our currency, to get to know our athletes, for them to get to know each other, to create safe spaces, for them to speak openly and vulnerably, the rest of the currency, actually, you're going to get, you're going to get more out of them than just focusing on the X's and O's. I would agree with that 100%. Um, you know, one of the things that's really interesting to me is when I watch your team compete, it always looked like you all were having fun. Like, I don't know, they were intense, but it always looked like they were having fun. How did you manage and create the kind of team culture where your student athletes were very competitive, but even in the midst of all of the pressure, they found a way to release and just have fun. What, what, what did you do to create that? Well, um, I remember we had won four national championships in five years, but our fan base had not grown. We were still stuck around 3,000, 3,500 people in Poly Pavilion that seats 13,000. And we're in Los Angeles where, you know, on any given night, you can go to the theater or football, basketball, baseball, whatever. There's never um, a lack of anything to do in LA or you can go to the beach <laughs> 360 days a year. So I thought, okay, you know what? When we come to the point of playing in, in the competitions, sport is entertainment. I am buying for the entertainment dollar. I want, like our fan base are usually families with the young children. I want that demographic to want to spend their hard earned dollars coming to our home gymnastics meets and going to a movie. So how am I gonna do that? And coming from the theater background, I just started producing our gymnastics meets. And down to the minute, and we had the run of show, and I had a producer, and I had an event director, and we just, like, every, now all sports are produced because they're on TV, but we weren't on TV then. But I just started creating a production, and it was fun, and it was the, I remember my overall um, concern was I didn't want the fans to be sitting in the stands feeling like they were external outside of what was happening in the energy of the team. I needed to, to figure out how to bring the fans onto the floor with us. And funny, but um, I remember the first time we did this, one of my student athletes did a bar routine. She stuck the dismount and we were right by the student section. Student section went crazy. So Instead of letting her high five all her teammates, I grabbed her and put her under the stanchion and I said, run up and down the stadium steps and high five all the student athletes. Well, she had to like snake the stadium steps. <laughs> and, and one of the greatest basketball players that ever lived, Michael Warren, he was in the stands and he said, you're the meanest coach alive. He said, your girl hits a beautiful routine. She gets a 10.0 and you make her run stadium steps. <laughs> But wow. But what I mean, I'm just I almost got goosebumps when you were talking and thinking about what that must have felt like her to get that perfect landing and to stick it. But then also to be able to invite everybody in that arena to be a part of that moment with her. 
masterful move, brilliant move, coach, br brilliant move. Um, one of the other things is that with you having zero years of gymnastics coaching experience, well, that meant that you needed a you needed a higher well. So, right. what did you do when it was time to hire? Um, because I would imagine that people you hired also because of the success went on to become head coaches and at, at other places. So what did you do to keep the culture moving in the right direction? And I know that your hires had to be a part of that. Talk to us a little bit about what are some of the specific skills um, or values do you, do you or did you look for when hiring assistant coaches or people to be a part of your staff? Well, I had to hire people that were true students of the sport because I didn't know I knew nothing. Um, and when you say I didn't coach, I had never done a cartwheel, so nothing. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was it was wonderful and lovely to be able to bring these coaches in for an interview and just build them up and tell them how impressed I was with their resumes and and question them about t coaching techniques and just say, "Wow, this is great." But the flip side of that and almost the most important part of it was to share with them my philosophy of why we're going to coach. Okay. We're not, we're not going to focus on the wins. We're going to focus on developing champions in life through the sport of gymnastics. And that is something that even though I've never done a cartwheel, I feel I can do that as well, if not better than anybody else in the country. So when I say, when I'm getting the feel that um, the team is needing a day off, I'm gonna we're gonna give them a day off because in I don't know most sports, but in our sport, if you take a day off, it means you're lazy. And I'm like, no, 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 it's gonna be active healing. One thing I did that coaches thought was crazy. Lisa Fernandez, one of the all-time best softball pitchers on the planet, thought I was nuts when I did this with my team. Um, I just felt like they were give, like when they would say that they couldn't come in for a uh, training and they would say, Oh, my allergies are acting up or I have a migraine or whatever. I kind of, I didn't believe them all the time. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I don't want to just call them out and say, I don't believe you. And I also want to be, I don't want to be checking up on them either. So you still on the quarter system, 10 weeks of school. I gave our student athletes three personal days, a quarter. And a personal day is a day that you can take off for any reason you want, as long as you let me know and you let the trainer know. So if you're taking off because you're not feeling well, I'm going to want you to go in and see the trainer. You can't take a personal day on a day we have a team meeting. You can't take a personal day on the day we have an interest squad. But I remember one time when, uh, when we first started giving the girls personal days and one of them was testing me and she said, Miss Al, I'm going to take a personal day tomorrow. I was like, okay, you, you okay? And she said, yes, they're having a designer jean sale down in the garment district. And she said it kind of like, <laughs> awesome. this is my size. If you find anything fun, let me know and, and buy it for me. Okay. <laughs> so, but the personal day thing really, really worked because I only get three. So it taught them how to time manage. It taught them to look through their quarter. One of the, when are they going to need to take a personal day off to study for an, an exam to finish a paper? If your family is coming in town and you want to spend a long weekend or you want to go home for a long weekend. And the important part about it was you can't question why they want to take that day off. And um, I am now mentoring the new head coach at the University of Arkansas, Jordan Weaver. And I was thrilled to just find out that she gives her team's personal days and she's an Olympic gold medalist and she gives her team personal days. So when I said you had zero years coaching, I think it was because the old school way of coaching, that doesn't seem to be who you ever were. You always seem to have been a teacher. And it sounds like at every turn you've been teaching young women how to take control and ownership of their life, their space, their mental head space, as well as their bodies and self-care. I mean, what an incredible lesson for a gymnast and for any student athlete for that matter. So I appreciate you being a master teacher 
who just happens to coach. Um, the other thing is you had shared something with me about a conversation that you had with Kobe Bryant. And you said it was like an hour long conversation. And you said, Felicia, it was one of the best conversations I've ever had. I would love for you to share with everybody what resonated with you in the conversation that you had with Kobe that you still hold on to today. First of all, when you said and you took a pause before you said his name, chills went all the way down my body um, because he is was that magnificent. Of, of a human. And um, I went down to meet with him to talk with him about his production company and, uh, and something that I hoped he would produce. And he came in, his, like, it was so funny. He said, first of all, he comes in, he goes, okay, here's the legend. And I think he's talking about himself. <laughs> okay, what's he talking about? And he goes, I don't know whether to be thrilled with you or mad at you. And I'm like, <laughs> Okay, I haven't even said hello to you yet. So what's going on? And he had three daughters. The baby wasn't born at the time. And um, he said, my daughters have watched that full routine of Caitlin Ohashi. It's like on instant replay in our house for like the last four, four months. And I'm going, well, great. And I go, what are you so upset about? He goes, no, I'm just kidding. He said, the reason why I'm so thrilled that my daughters are watching that is because they're seeing a high performance of excellence combined with joy. He said, every time we watch that routine, we just feel and she exudes joy. And the rest of the conversation with Kobe was talking about him talking about when you infuse joy into the process of learning anything. And he said, even helping his kids with school, you get such a, a more rich product in the end. And he said, there's never any reason to not infuse joy, infuse joy in the process. And I said, well, how, what did that look like for you, Kobe, when you were playing? And he said, getting up at 4.30 in the morning and putting in two extra practices before the team came in. He says, Miss Val, because there's a difference between happy and joy. And he goes, happy is stuff that happens externally for you that you, you're happy. He said, joy comes from a deep, deep place of pride and pride in a job well done. He said, so when I knew that I was putting in that extra work and sacrificing the, my, maybe some sleep or something like that to get in that extra work, he said, even if we didn't win a game, nothing could take away that sense of pride and joy. Mm -hmm. and, um, it was, I mean, he was just beaming when he talked about this. It was absolutely one of my best experiences in my life. You know, you beam when you talk about your student athletes, like you, like you glow when you talk about them and, and Caitlin and the other young ladies who competed for you. I, I, you know, sometimes when you have athletes who rise to the top, apparently you're close to Caitlin. What did you do so that the other student athletes weren't jealous of the relationship or what did you do to connect and form a special bond with all of them such that they all felt that way? Because joy seems to be something that you found a way of infusing, not just into your program, but into the young women that you coached. You know, I did have a few student athletes say to me, I, I wish I would have figured out how to have a relationship with you like Caitlin does or they would mention some of the other athletes and that were close that I was very, very close with. And I realized then that the athletes that I had a really great close relationship with, they sought me out. They stopped by my office. They called me um, periodically to go have coffee or lunch. Um, it wasn't like I sought them out to have that relationship. And in hindsight, I wish I would have done a better job of even spending 10 minutes, 15 minutes connecting with the ones that I didn't have a close relationship with. Even though I had individual meetings a lot with student athletes, sometimes weekly, but outside of my office, like, no, let's just go to coffee or something like that. And I remember 
feeling badly about that dynamic. You know, there were some athletes that you just connect with. And I remember Coach Wooden saying that he loved all of his, he called them his boys. He loved all of his boys the same, but he didn't necessarily like them all the same. And I thought, you know, that's kind of the truth. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that even the ones I didn't click with, I honestly can say that my intention in coaching them was the same. That I, every everything I did and said or didn't say to them was to help them become the best versions of themselves, um, regardless of whether how close our relationship was. Mm -hmm. That was good. That was good. You are so self-aware. And, and I hear people talk about how important emotional intelligence is. And you've used so many of the different components and characteristics of emotional intelligence. So my next question is about evaluating yourself. If you were evaluating the end of your coaching career, what would you tell your 25 to 30 year old self today? about what you wish you would have known then that you know now about emotional intelligence? Um, I think I, I wish that I would have known to model the behavior for my student athletes of what it meant to be vulnerable and um, to be able to admit when I've done something wrong and to sincerely apologize. Um, I've never had a problem apologizing and really admitting when I'm wrong because, I mean, think about it. I did a lot wrong because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but I still postured as the leader and in, and. I don't remember when we started doing this, but we would have team meetings that we would just call our circle of trust and it was a safe space. And it wasn't like they were sitting and I was standing. We were all seated. And so we were all on the same level. And I would come in with questions that open-ended questions that would encourage vul really vulnerable conversation. And, um, and in doing so, I shared my own vulnerabilities with them. Uh, I mean, I mean, I can get it. I, I would love to share my, my cancer experience with you as well. But I remember that being a time when the girls coming to me and just saying, are you really okay? And I want to say, yeah, I'm fine. It's great. I'm going to be fine. You know, it's no big deal. And I shared with them, you know, some, sometimes I wake up and I'm really scared. And this is how I get past that. And she, feeling how the power of vulnerability, I think, is something that if you ex, if you can test it out and experience, you'll feel how it makes you stronger and it makes your connection and your relationships stronger. I think that what I really like about this, the circle conversation, and again, thinking about what you know now, your capacity to develop independent thinkers and empower women seems to be exceptional. How were you able to develop the independent thought that it took for them to really believe in themselves the way that they did? Because gymnastics seemed to be a lot about confidence. Um, if, there, if you ask my student athletes, the one thing that I wanted them to get out of being in our program was the understanding that every single thing we do in life is a choice. Every single action that you do in life is a choice. And unless we have, you have a mental disability, it starts with your thoughts. It starts with the thoughts you feed and it starts with the thoughts that you choose to starve. And those thoughts are going to produce emotions, which are going to produce actions and each action is going to have numerous repercussions for the rest of your life. So I can't 
it was, I just loved sharing this. I would share this with recruits that this is the one thing I want you to get out of our program. And then the freshman year, and I would just hammer it, you know, every chance I could get life is about choice and the choices you make dictate the life you live. And almost every single year, a freshman would come up to me and say, you know, Miss Val, you know that life is about choice thing. <laughs> um, I just can't help it when my mind goes to mean girl. And I go, oh, oh, really? Really? You can't help it. And then I would talk her through the thoughts that she would have and how she could replace those mean girl thoughts with other thoughts that were not judgmental. And it was so cool, Felicia, because it was after, it would take about a year and a half. I noticed halfway through their sophomore year, they would get it. And they would come to me and they'd say, I finally get it. And the beauty of it was when you take ownership of your thoughts and consequently your actions, you can no longer be a victim in life. And once you're no longer a victim in life, your whole life opens up to you because you're not playing defense constantly. You're on the offense and you're, as I say, choreograph your life, how you want it to come out. Don't wait to see what happened, how, what life throws at you and then have a pity party over it. Choreograph your life, take your life, take charge of your life. Yeah. I think that um, one of the things that I know about gymnastics is that you have to be very disciplined in your body, your mind. You have to be very disciplined what was your philosophy on discipline as it relates to, because when you recruited young people, you recruited them for, for, for a reason. You knew that they could compete at that level. When they didn't show up and compete the way that you thought they were capable of, how did you handle that? Uh, well, I think it's extremely important to be very clear about the culture about the team philosophies, about the negotiables and the non-negotiables. And as Brene Brown says, uh, clear is kind and unclear is unkind. And so I would be very clear about what it meant to be a part of our program and what accountability would look like. And if they were not playing by the playbook, what the circumstances would be for them. Um, I never ever used conditioning or running as punishment because it's kind of like using vegetables as punishment for your children. Uh, I don't want them to think of conditioning. Yeah. A lot of athletes don't like to condition. So when we would have extended, Oh, so then another thing that I did that I think was really good. I don't think it was good. I know it was good was I would have them set up the accountability for the, the issues that may come up. So it's not okay to be late. We all know, especially in athletics, that early is on time. On time is late. So if they did not show up at the certain amount of time, they were late. Okay, so I wasn't the one that said, what's the repercussion going to be or the punishment? I let the team decide. And once a team takes ownership of things like that within their team, they not only hold themselves accountable, they're, they're holding their teammates accountable. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing. So it was like, okay, you're late, you know, you gotta go do this because you all agreed to it. It's not me. I'm just the enforcer of, of the team rules. Um, but one time I had, and well, not one time, a few times I had athletes that just did not make changes. And I didn't want to quote unquote punish them, but I wanted them to be a consequence. My husband was our defensive coordinator at UCLA for football. So I went home and I asked him, I'm like, give me something I can do that they're gonna hate, that they're gonna remember for the rest of their lives and hopefully gonna curb the issues that we're having. And he says, have them roll the field. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, get them out on, on the football field at 5.30 in the morning, and let them drop down on their sides and just roll, log roll the length of the field. And he says, they're gonna hate it. They're gonna be cold and freezing. They're gonna be humiliated because other teams are out there and it'll be something that they'll remember the rest of their lives. To this day. <laughs> oh, wow. 
thing that the alumni talk about. Remember we had to roll the field and blah, 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 blah. Wow. Brilliant. Because it didn't destroy their bodies. You know, it wasn't like I was running them to death or they were, I was making them do rope climbs and jacking up their shoulders. It was just humiliating and, and, and annoying. <laughs> Wow. You know, one of the things that I thought about um, when you evaluate yourself, it's not about the wins for you. What is it about? What are the things that you evaluate when you reflect on your career and you think about what you've achieved? What are the things that you hold in the highest regard? Can I look back and honestly say to myself and my maker that the decisions that I made, every decision I made was my intention self-serving and did it come from my ego or was the intention to help them become a better version of themselves. And even the student athletes that I did uh, remove from the team and not renew their scholarships that were furious with me. I could honestly say I felt it was the best thing for them. And I've had a few of them actually come out publicly and say how much they hated me at that time. But they came to realize it actually saved their lives. They started making different decisions after that. Um, and I do, I do want to share with you and, and your audience. Um, I was, I was a work in progress. We all are a work in progress, but figuring all of this out and how to be an inspiring and motivating coach versus a dictator for many, many years, but it really clicked um, when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I say that because for those of you that have gone through something like this, you know the massive noise in your head when you get a diagnosis like that. And it's like, how many more days do I have to live? Am I going to have to quit my job? How painful is it going to be? And just noise and fear. And in the midst of all of that mental chaos, I heard very, very, very clearly mm. be anxious for nothing mm. and grateful for all things. And I stopped and some of you may think that that's cosmic energy speaking to me or the universe. I knew it was God speaking to me. And I, full disclosure, got cocky with God. And I said, I don't know if you heard or not, but I just got diagnosed with a potentially fatal disease. So this be anxious for nothing thing is not resonating really well with me. And I heard it a second time. And I went home and I told my husband about the breast cancer. And I said, but get this. I heard be anxious for nothing and grateful for all things. And he said, it's from the Bible. Well, I had never read the Bible. So he goes, go look it up. So I go look it up. And sure enough, there it is in black and white. And I was like, this is a commandment. And I chose to obey the commandment, but I did not know how I was going to obey because I was still scared to death. And I went into my doctor's office the next day and she said to me, had you gotten diagnosed 10 years ago, which was not that long ago, we would have nothing for you. And I would say, I'm so sorry. You need to go get your affairs in order. But if you choose to get chemotherapy for a year and surgery, I know it's going to work. And I was like, I get it. I get the commandment, be anxious for nothing through gratitude. I didn't have to get chemotherapy. I got to get chemotherapy because I live at a time that had the chemo. And I lived in a country that had the chemo. And I had a job that's going to help me pay for the chemo. I was so excited to get chemotherapy that I called it going to my chemo spa because a spa is someplace you go to get better. And switching that one word, have to, to get to in every aspect of my life literally changed my life for the better. And being able to share all of this with my team that year and the consequent teams really elevated my coaching game um, and the relationship 
and the impact that I had on these young women. I almost feel like I could cry. I'm so moved by that. I'm grateful, one, to your husband for suggesting and saying, you got to go get the Bible, pick it up, read it. And knowing that it says that be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. I'm grateful for that because I have a husband. When things go wrong, he says, let's turn to the Bible. That's one of the greatest gifts that God could give us. And it almost has me really choked up. Um, the other book that I want to reference is your book, Miss Miss Val. Life is short. Don't wait to dance. How did you come up with the name for your book? Oh, thank you for asking that question. I love the story. Um, I was very, very blessed to have the great Coach Wooden as a dear, dear friend. We were, my husband and I were like family to him and he was to us and he was my mentor. And as we all know, Coach lived to be 99 years old in nine months. And the last few years that I was with him, anytime we went somewhere, somebody would ask him, you know, coach, you've lived an impeccable life. Do you have any regrets? And he would always be sitting with his hands like this and his little blue eyes would start to get misty eyed. Mm -hmm. And he would say, you know, my wife, Nellie, who passed on 35 years ago, my wife, Nellie loved to dance. And I never danced with her because I was never a very good dancer. And I was always very, very shy. He says, and I re realized too late that if I did dance with my wife, people wouldn't make fun of me. They would simply look at a couple deeply in love dancing. So if I do have one regret, I wish I could go back and dance with my wife. So the title of the book is an homage to Coach Wooden. Wow. Life is short. And because it is, I'd like to ask you, my final question is, what do you want the third act of your life to reflect? You've done it all. You have it all. What do you want this third act to reflect? I would love to continue to be able to speak with people like you and share the message of change and what true leadership looks like um, and how and just share everything that I've done, all the good, the bad, the ugly, everything so that other people can can choose how to what how they want to live their lives and choose their actions how they how help other people best choreograph their lives um and on a personal very personal note one reason why i retired was because i have got in the works right now three productions that i am just if they're gonna get done one of them was our 2018 national championship um, was one of the biggest comebacks in sport history. And if you have a moment and you want to spend three minutes on YouTube, go look up UCLA Gymnastics 2018, Peng Peng Lee. She was our last performer of the evening. And just to let you know, we were in fourth place the entire meet until the last competitor on the last event, Peng Peng Lee went. And I'm not gonna tell you more than that um, because you're gonna see it on YouTube and it'll just bring chills. So I wanna get that made into a movie. I want to get, um, I'm very much into the environment and I would love to get a film um, about the environment made about, and it's called Trash. Um, it may be a, a Broadway show if live theater when it does come back. Um, and my passion, passion project is an urban nutcracker. I want oh, the glory of Tchaikovsky <laughs> to the streets and street performance arts and X games and different styles of dance and all of that. So I'm going to be really, really busy. I plan on living till at least 103 and I got a lot to do. That sounds, uh, now I'm starting to think that could this be like, the Hamilton yes. of the Nutcracker experience. And I can see you accepting your Tony Award now. Um, Miss Val, this has given me so much pleasure to be able to talk with you and to hear you say that in act three of my life, Felicia, I want to keep sharing, teaching, 
and coaching. And so if there's anybody out there who would like that as much as I would, you can go to Miss Val's website, officialmissval.com, and she would be happy to talk with you about joy, grace, and the beauty of having a competitive spirit and the benefits thereof. If you'd like to purchase her book, Life is Short, Don't Wait to Dance, and I see a copy in the background over there, you can get a copy on Amazon.com. And the other thing that I would like to remind you of is that the party's not over. If you would like to ask questions to Miss Val, we are going to transition to Zoom. So you can find the link for Zoom. It's right there on the screen. Go to a stepupinc.org. And for the next 30 minutes, Miss Val is going to answer any question you might throw at her, and she will be happy to do so. A step up registration for our a Step Up Symposium, which is open to any assistant coach who's a lifelong learner. Our next level program is for aspiring head coaches. We're planning on having, I think we already have close to 20 executive search firms signed up. And our Head Coaches Executive Leadership Academy, which will feature other coaches like Valerie Condo Spiel and Bev Kearney, and the best that the nation has to offer for anyone who wants to take a step up in their career and get to the next level. Registration will be open by March 1st, and you can go to a stepupinc.org to register. Again, we look forward to seeing you on Zoom, visit a stepupinc.org. Thank you so much, Miss Val. The party's not over. We'll see you all soon. Thanks for joining us tonight.